from the book of Luke. I want to take a look at that 14th chapter. And in that 14th chapter, this is an old familiar passage. Uh, we've probably heard it several times. But even as we make ready to go to the book of Luke, the 14th chapter. Amen? If you have it, if you just stand with me just to honor the word of God as I read a few of these verses in your hearing. <clears throat> in the book of Luke, the 14th chapter, if you still don't have it, it should be up on the screen, I believe by now. Uh, we're coming from the King James Version of the uh, Bible this morning, um, starting at the 15th verse. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat the bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, Jesus is speaking now, A certain man gave a great supper, inviting many, and his servant and he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are ready. But they all were on one accord and began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I asked you to have me excuse. And another asked, I have bought five oxen or yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excuse. And still, a, and still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I can't come. He didn't even ask and he can be excused. He married a wife. That was it right there. I ain't coming. So the servant came and reported these things to the mass, his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you command and still there is room then the master said to the servant go out into the highways into the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled for I say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste my supper you may be seated <coughs> Just for thought today, priority checklist, a priority checklist. It's so quiet in here. Why is it that we feel we can offer excuses when it comes to the church? That is, would be ridiculous if we use it anywhere else. Have you ever wondered what would happen if people are uh, intensely and committed and determined about the church as they are about their sports or any other pastime? Some years ago, Moody Monthly ran a piece which includes a fellow that might quit his sports. And it goes like this. He says, he might be quitting his sport. Every time I went, they asked for money. The people with whom I sat didn't seem very friendly. The seats were too hard and uncomfortable. The coach never came to see me. 
the referee made decisions which I could not agree with. I was sitting with some hypocrites. They only came to see what others were wearing. Some games went into overtime and I got home late. The band played numbers that I have never heard before. The games were scheduled when I had other things to do. My parents took me to too many games when I was growing up. Since I read the books on sports and I feel that I know more than the coach anyhow. I didn't want to make my children go because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they're going to like best. This was a quote from uh, Charles Swindoll back in 1998 of why people would quit sports. Amen? This is going to be Y'all y'all gonna be so quiet on me. This gonna be I'm gonna make this long. Cause because if y'all don't push me, then I'm gonna have to cheat a little bit, amen? amen. In our scriptures, coming from looking at verse 15, verse 15 says, Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him. Blessed is he who shall eat the bread in the kingdom of God. When you look at that just right there, you would think that this man is being honorable. And because he's being honorable, then Jesus has to give him a parable to go along with the statement he just said. But here's what really kind of took place. Because if we look back into our scriptures and we back up just a couple of verses, because if we back up to verse 12, we find out then he said to him who was invited, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back so you can be repaid. Then Jesus says, here's what you do. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at resurrection of the just. Now, 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 this particular man sitting at the table, you got to understand that they're in the house of the Pharisees. And being in the house of the Pharisees, the Pharisees already felt because they are God's chosen people that they're going to be automatically into the kingdom because they're in the lineage of Abraham. And everybody knows that the Jews are God's faith chosen people. You know that? Amen? Amen. Oh, all right, just checking. So when he makes this statement, and not listening to what Jesus said beforehand. Now it looks like he's setting himself up. Because now he's saying, blessed is he who shall eat the bread and the kingdom of God. That's, that's me. I'm a Pharisee. I'm going to be eating the bread and the kingdom of God. And then he goes and says, then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And his servants at supper time said to those who were invited, come, all is ready. Those who were in the house of the Pharisees, no doubt, got Jack realized that something was about to happen because Jesus just turned around and said we're going to be sitting on that day in the kingdom of the righteousness of God and we're going to eat the bread with him and again they didn't realize that and sometimes we even miss it that they didn't realize that they were sitting at the table with the son of God 
They were too busy not looking at the blessing that was sitting in front of them. They were looking for the blessing in the future. Sometimes we're the same way. We, we, we miss the, our blessings that's right here in front of us because we're expecting something else and we're looking for something else. We can, we could have more concerns about this man looking to pronounce the blessings than eating at the table of the kingdom. Eating bread in the kingdom speaks of celebration that was provided for deliverance and salvation. This was an anticipation of hope of Israel. Just because they felt they were in the lineage of Abraham, they had a place at the table. But Jesus had to give them this parable. Y'all know how Jesus is. Jesus got to give you a parable so to make you kind of think on something. And as he begins to give the parable, parable some of them says, some, some, some of them said, didn't we already have this conversation? And he said, yeah, we kind of did over in chapter 13 when somebody asked only a few will be saved somewhere around verse 23 and, and, and in other words the neck the gates going to be narrow not everybody's going to make it in just a chosen few so not everybody is going to be sitting at the table and it's funny because whenever someone invites you to a great supper the guests will have to arrange to come. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me put it to you this way. This was a man who had stature in the town. The story that Jesus is telling is a, is a, is a man who had stature in the town and invited folks to come to dinner. And you say, uh, 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 what, what's, the, what's the point in this? How many of you got invitations to go to a wedding? Or got invitations to go somewhere and you had to respond back? You had to send a response, I'm coming. I'll be there. There's two of us coming. There's three of us coming. You had to send your, your response back to the person who was hosting the, the wedding. This man sent out an invitation inviting folks to come. Folks says, yes, I'm coming. I, I, I need to be seen. This, this man, he's, he's putting on, a, he's putting on a, a great feast. I want to go. I am who I am, and I need to be seen when I get there. So I plan to go. So the man goes, and he prepares for the dinner. Now it depends on if it was going to be like a wedding because a wedding can take up to 12 months to prepare. But he just says it's just a great supper. So it might have took just a couple weeks because he had to go out back in them days and kill the animals and bring in the stuff that he needed in order to feed the people that he promised, that he invited. So you think the man went out and spent all this money, got everything ready for the people to come and be a part of a great supper. And he says to his servant, all things are now ready. And when I need you to go out and let folks know that things are now ready and see and, and 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 when he begins to do that my, my first point was when he begins to do that he, he he looked and the man began to go out and look for the people to see if they were still coming and and and, and see where their priorities were and my first point is a misplaced priority to things because in, in verse uh, 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 in verse 18 it says, but all they were on one accord and began to make excuses. The first said, I to him, I have bought a piece of ground 
and I must go and see it. I asked to be excused. Well, you know, he bought a piece of ground. And, and really, if that was his priority, that's really honorable. Because he was trying to keep his priority because he bought some ground. But on the surface, that was a good excuse. I can't come because I bought some ground I, and I got to go take a look at it. But when you begin to look into it a little more and you begin to, to study it a little more, if he bought the ground, did he buy it without seeing it? Now you already commit to coming to my dinner. Now I tell you everything is ready and you want to tell me you can't come because you need to go see some dirt. And, and, and not only that, you own the dirt. Now, you can't go see the dirt before dinner. You can't go see the dirt after dinner. Wait a minute. You own the dirt. You don't need an appointment to go see your own land. So his excuse did not look right. I'm talking about Jews. I ain't talking about y'all. Cause, 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 cause if I was talking about y'all, I would say y'all make excuses that you can't come to church because you got to clean your house or, 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 or you got to go get your nails done or you saw some hair in the window and, and you got to get there. Bef and the only way you get there is, is during church time. And, 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 and if the truth is told, even the money that you're spending to go get that hair or get your nails done could have been your tides. No, 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 no. Wrong priorities. He had a priority, which was okay, but he had it in backwards. If God or if the man invites you to supper and you agree to come, then you need to hold your priority to where you need to go. Y'all uh, gonna make me. Y'all uh, gonna make me. See, 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 when we begin to to even look into the scriptures on that, we run into a couple in the book of Acts, chapter number five. Y'all know who they are, Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira had priorities. They said, we're going to sell our piece of property and we're going to give the proceeds to the church, the church of God. Now they go and they sell their piece of property, but now their priorities change. The money becomes top of the priority. And now when they decide that they're going to go to the church, they go in with a lie saying this is what we got for the land. And because they had went in with a lie, they lost their life over a lie. Amen. Their priorities changed. Now, now, y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me because somebody said I might be beating on them, man. And I ain't beating on them. Verse 19 is my second point. A misplaced priority to work. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Verse 19 said, and another said, I bought five Ox, ox, yokes of oxen, and I am going to test them. I'm gonna ask you if I could be excused. The second excuse came from a man who bought some oxen. Now, 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 don't get me wrong. This this guy who bought the oxen might have been a farmer. 
he, he might have been one that just loves to work and he might have been one that just worked really hard and, and because he works really hard he was committed to he wanted to go out and do what he needs to do because everybody knows a workaholic is not lazy and y'all looking at one I'm a workaholic and it's not lazy and the Bible says in 2nd Thessalonians 3 and 10 for everywhere we were with you we command you this if any one will not work nor shall he eat but the problem was your priority is wrong you have a high priority to work and the man invites you in for supper and you rather go work than go and have supper with the man. Now, once again, you had got an invitation beforehand. And with that invitation beforehand, if you weren't going to come, then you shouldn't have accepted the invitation. Some of us think that we have to work two and three jobs in order for God to bless you. But then where is your faith? We, oh, we don't have to work as hard as it looks like we have to because our priorities is all wrong. You got invited in, you accepted the invitation, and after you get the invitation, you say, I can't come, I got to go to work. We don't want to miss heaven because we got to go to work. We, we want to we do what God wants us to do. And, and sometimes we got to stop and look at our priorities. Yes, you got to work. Yes, you got to eat. But you got six other days. That's the way I look at it. And if you got to work on Sunday, you ain't got to work when it's time to be here. Some of y'all I know go to work after you leave here. And that's all right. But we're supposed to be leaving today holy. You know, for the life of me. Oh, Lord, I'm going somewhere else. For, for, the, for the life of me. As being a boss and being in leadership and talking with people there's two types of people and they'll go I, I I would like to have Sundays off to go to church but you put my boss make me work the other one says I would like to have Sundays off to go to church and then you get it but you don't go to church <laughs> Where's your priorities? Why don't you give it to the person who wants to go? Oh my God, no, no. No, let me stop. We, we, we got visitors. And the problem comes, we begin to make so many excuses and that because we make so many excuses, we, we, we don't do what Christ wants us to do. We're not doing what God wants us to do because we keep making excuses after excuses after excuses. You know, I, yeah, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. But if I asked you to teach a class, you would come up with an excuse. If I asked you to work at the youth church with the kids, you would come up with an excuse. If I asked you to, to do different things in the church, you would come up with an excuse of why you can't do it. You make a commitment to be here, but for some reason you just cancel out because you make an excuse because you, you just make excuses. Somewhere along the line, we need to stop making excuses and set the right priorities. Colossians says, and whenever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord 
and not unto men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive rewards and your inheritance. For you have served the Lord. All that's telling me is everything I do for Christ will stand. Everything else will fall. You got to check your priority list. You got to see where you are in the midst of this. You got to look at your list when it comes to things. You got to get your list when it comes to work. Is your priority list set correctly? Well, we got one more. Number three, misplaced priorities to family. Verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife. I cannot come. That boy sound handpick. <laughs> handpack, however you call it. I got married. I cannot come. Y'all gotta, gotta understand something. And you know what? On the surface, that sounds like a good excuse. I got married. I got a wife now. I can't come. But when you look at the scriptures and you look at the time and the season, the wife is a piece of property. The wife is equal as a dog during this time. The wife has no say so in nothing. Now he got the invitation. He knew he had to go eat. He could have told them then he wasn't coming. But he put the blame on his wife. I can't come. I got married. My wife said so. He'd be laughed out of the village. Because the wife cannot say what the man could do during that time. But Jesus put it out there. And he put it out there for them to see. And as he put it out there for them to see, and, and, and see what well, some of these excuses don't just don't seem right. Is there any priority higher than family? A fact there is. Matthew 10 and 37. He who loves his father or his mother more than he loves me is not, I mean, more is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than he loves, he is not worthy of me. I messed that scripture all up. He who loves the father or the mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Should we love our family? Obviously we should. We look at the importance. We look at where the priority is. And where the priority is, we cannot put uh, 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 our family over God. And when we begin to put our family over God, we begin to miss out on what God has in store for us. You know, I, 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 I like what co-pastor said. Co-pastor said, they took my son's life, but yet she still came to church. It took them seven years to find the murderers. But God had a plan. And we left it in God's hands. And when you leave it in God's hands, God will take care, not only you, but your family. The other thing she said, she said, she said, when you come in and you give God praise, honor, and glory, he promised to take care of your family. So when you put your family over God, oh my God, you're missing the blessings. Your priorities will be wrong. And don't get me wrong. I, 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 
I love my family. I, I love my grandkids. I, I, I love being around them. But when it comes time to go to church, I'm doing what God has called me to do. I need to take care of God's business first and then go and spend time with them. Now, 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 sometime, if the truth is told, the only reason you ain't spending time with your family is because there's times where you're supposed to be spending time with your family, you're busy doing something else. And if you turn on TV off sometime, you can spend a little more time with your family. And if you catch them when they're young, they will come to church with you because they want to be with you. Bring a child up in the church. That's the matter with society right now. Society put their friends and their family over God. And when they got, they said, my mother brought me to church so much that I'm not going to church anymore. And when I get my kids, because now it's kids having kids. It, it, it ain't adults having babies. It's kids having kids. And the only thing they're thinking about doing is getting back down to a size two and trying to get in the club and look as young as they possibly can. Where the kid looks all raggedy, walking around with hair ain't being combed, teeth ain't being brushed, because you don't have time because you're trying to get to the club. Wait a minute, we, we got company. All I'm trying to say is where's your priorities? Because your priorities may be set wrong. And, and if you're the type of person, you, you, you say, well, I put my kids before I put church, then, then, then that's fine. But you stop looking at those kids outside shooting one another. Because there ain't no God in their life. They ain't afraid of nobody. They ain't afraid of no God. But if you teach them the right way, if your priorities were set a little different, if your priorities were set, let me worship God first. Let me serve God first. You know where tithing really starts? Tithing starts when your kids see you tithing and know that you're struggling, but God makes a way out of no way for you. Because they see how you, what, what God has done for you. Then when they get in that same situation, they realize that my mama and my daddy, mine I had the lights turned out. But then they went to church and paid their tithes. Didn't make any sense whatsoever. But you know what? The following day, the lights came back on. They don't know how the lights got back on. They just know the lights came back on. They were going through some stuff, but yet they got up and paid their tithes. Your kids watch you. Yes. That's how they learn. Yes. Misplace. Misplace priorities. Yeah, okay. I'm going to leave y'all alone for the priorities. Because I'm talking about the Jews. Because cause, cause the Jews had misplaced their priorities. They were, they were looking at the wrong things things you know and and and, and uh, okay lord i i i, I was gonna say that I, 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 see, some folks look at church as a pastime if i feel like going i'm going if i don't feel like going i ain't going they look at it, it's unnecessary. I don't need to go to church. I can stay home and worship and praise them all by myself. But Hebrew says, forsake not to assemble ourselves together as a manner of some is, 
but exhort one another and as much you will see of the day approaching you need your brother you need your sister they're going to help you to make oh my god they're going to help you to make it through God said, God said, God said, I want to see my house full. In order to see the house full, we have to really begin to look into the word. Because what ends up happening, if you really want to see the house full, look at you. Because if you want the house full, then you got to make like, or, or not pretend, but you got to show faith that the house is full. And as you show faith that the house is full, God says, now, 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 if you want the house full, he goes, watch the church grow. As the church grow, you say, how, well, well, pastor, how are we growing? We're growing in grace. We're growing in love. We're growing with mercy. But we have to learn how to not continue to grow, but to go out. See, 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 we can grow all together. If we think 20 or 30 people is enough for this church just to minister, then we'll never go past 20 or 30 people. But when we look at the, what the world has to offer and the people that are dying all around us, then we know that we need to go out and compel them and bring them into the service. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He told his servant. I need you to go out and compel them. Go to the highways and to the hedges and ask them to come in. I, 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 I like that part because, because you have to really get into it a little bit. See, see y'all got me trying to do a little bit of teaching in here. See, see. What ends up happening is when it went to the streets and the city to get the folks to come into the house, the people in the city knew that those were where the Jewish people go. And because those are where the Jewish people go, we're not allowed in there because the Jews do not want the lame, the crippled, and the blind, and the half to be in the same place as them because they may get condemned. They, they may walk away with contamination. So you have to go out into the streets and bring them in. He was telling you to bring them in because they just did not want to come because they knew who house it was. And then he turns around and says, you know what? I need you to go out into the highways and to the hedges. So he done went from the city to the highways and the hedges and said, I need you to compel those folks to come because those folks don't believe that they're even worthy enough to come in the city. And because they don't think they're worthy enough to come in the city, now you got to compel them to come into the city, to come into the house so they can get their blessing. I, I, I really fell in, into studying the word. So so y'all, y'all, y'all. But we have to be a church that is willing to go out and do what God has calling us to do. We can't just sit back, open the doors, and expect folks to walk in. Oh, I, I know y'all think that, you know, it's the pastor's job to go out and get folks. It's the pastor's job to, to do this. It's the pastor's job to do that. But do you love your church? Do you love Jesus? Are you willing to share Jesus? Are you willing to share Jesus with somebody standing on a street corner? Are you willing to go and tell somebody how good God is to you? See, see. See, I, I took a couple weeks off. I, I'm trying to quit. But, but see, in order for me to, to let this go, I, I, I got to ask a couple of questions. Because what the Lord says, he said, he said look here now. I, I, I'm closing, I'm closing. He said, but look here now. He goes, all things is ready. The Lord invites you to the banquet table. Oh my God. Oh my God. And when he invites you to the banquet table, the Lord invites you to break bread with him. He invites you to drink from his cup. He invites you to be in his presence. 
you don't need to bring anything because it's already ready for you. The price of a mission has already been paid in full. He is Jehovah Jireh. He has made all provisions. And the word said he is the lamp. Jesus is the door. David said long ago, uh, thou shalt prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. Can't you see the Lord preparing the table for you? D this table looks better than your mother's table do during the holidays. This table is more scrunches than any restaurant that you'll ever go in. This table is better than a buffet. This table is better than a fellowship meal. I don't know about you, but I believe that when Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me and believe also in me and my father's house. There are many mansions. If it was not so, I would not tell you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And I come back and invite you to come. Oh my God. 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 See, 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 all things are ready. Salvation is ready. Love is ready. Joy is ready. Peace is ready. Deliverance is ready. Power is ready. Prosperity is ready. Healing is ready. Hope is ready. Grace is ready. Mercy is ready. Long suffering is ready. God the Father is ready. Lord our Christ is ready. The saints are ready. The church is ready. See, the question is, the question is, is you ready? Everything else is ready. Are you ready? Listen, see, see, I, I want to be like the servant. The servant went and says, uh, I went here and I went there and I done all that I can do. Wait a minute, let me. I, 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 I started going somewhere else. I, I, I started going somewhere else. But, and, and as he went, he came back and he said, you know, he said, he said, I got so much stuff up here. Why don't I just look, why don't I just look in the scripture? Because, because when the servant came back, don't mind me, because, because, go out quickly into the streets. He says, whatever I command you, still there's room. You know, go to the hedges, to the highways, compel them to come. And yet there was still room. And because there was still room, he says, he said, now, now, can you go say that you have went out and did as the law commanded? Can, can, can you as a congregation say, Lord, I did as you commanded? Can I say as a pastor, God, I did as you commanded? Can, can, can the deacons and the trustees say, God, I did as you commanded? And yet, there's still room. I'm done. I'm, I'm done, but I left out one scripture. And the scripture I left out was verse 24. See, the whole time God was giving this parable, he was giving it in a third person. When he got to verse 24, he began to speak. He said, for I say to you that none of these men who were invited shall taste my supper. That answers that man's question back in, court, in that verse 15. So if you were invited 
and you chose not to taste his food you will not make it into the kingdom but he loves you just that much that he keeps sending an invitation out over and over and over and over and over again and you keep coming up with all kinds of crazy excuses. But it's all right. Because there'll be a day that your excuses will end. There'll be a day that you're going to have to stand before God himself and answer to your excuses. That day you have no excuse. That day, when your life is flashed up on the screen, and he said, didn't I ask you to do this? Didn't I ask you to go there? Didn't I ask you to do this? And God has been talking to a lot of us. We can help our brothers and sisters. We have the means of helping them, but we don't help them. We'd rather sit back and talk about them Amen. versus lifting them up. Car broke down on the side of the road, you drive right on by. Turn your head like you don't even see them. Because if I stop, they're going to want to ride. I know nobody did that, but I hope not. But that's where we are sometimes. It's all about me, me, me. Because I'm saved, I know I'm going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Well, those Jews that were sitting at the table with Jesus said, because I'm in the lineage of Abraham, I'm going to make it into the kingdom. You need to be paying attention to what God is trying to tell you. Set your priorities. Set your priorities to honor God. Set your priorities to give God the glory. Set your priorities that God will use you to the fullest. Amen. Don't get lost in the world. Amen. 